Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in a moment. We have approximately 80 and counting participants in the room. I encourage you to turn on your video cameras, but I'm going to turn that over to your moderator to get things started. Thank you so much, Kevin. We appreciate your time. Uh, my name is Kofi Thompson. I'm with Deshaun Matias, who will be the star of the whole show tonight. Uh, but we are from IBM. Uh, before we kick off and I pass it over to Sean, I just want to make sure that we are following some certain um, housekeeping guidelines for this uh, session. So we make sure that we have a fruitful discussion and you get everything that you need out of it. So first things first, um, this meeting is being recorded. So um, make sure that you are good to go and you don't have any issues. Uh, the recording will also be sent to everyone who registered for this event and stored on NACME TV. Uh, participants are encouraged to turn on their cameras. We want to be seeing your bright shining faces and making sure that we are um, keeping y'all engaged. So if you could turn on your camera, if it is an option, please turn it on. If it's not, that's completely fine. Um, also make sure that you have an appropriate background um, uh, for your Zoom background as well too. And finally, uh, we'll unmute everyone the, at the start of the Q&A segment. Uh, so we can make sure that uh, you know, can ask any questions you have, make sure that we're giving you all the information that's necessary. Two things that I want to highlight before I pass it over to Sean. Um, one, I will be throwing a, a registration link into the chat. Uh, please fill out that registration link as quickly as possible so that we can uh, retain everyone who attended the session live and follow up with you. Also, we want to make sure that you are going to this link that uh, is right next to apply to jobs here. It's super important for you to do that. The link is ibm.biz slash NACME 2020. Um, please make sure again to go to the link and register and then go to the link and apply to jobs that, that fit your interests. There are no limitations to how many jobs you can apply to. And with that, I will pass it off to Deshaun. Thank you so much. You're on mute, Deshaun. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot, Kofi. All right. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, today, well, I'll give you a quick introduction of myself. My name is Deshaun Matias. I'm a software engineer at IBM. I've been working at IBM since 2013, graduate from the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. And um, uh, just truly passionate about helping out uh, the youth, helping out those that are under me because there was somebody there for me uh, when I was in your shoes and coming up. So I uh, love to mentor and, and give back. And, you know, this is something that I do uh, outside of my uh, 40 hours a week, uh, which has been this week, like 60 hours a week. But um, welcome, everybody. And I'll be uh, today. The objective is to prepare you all for technical assessments. So I have a, a few quick slides uh, that I'll give you some resources, some hints, and things that I would do uh, if I was in your shoes taking the technical assessments. And this is what I've learned over the time uh, doing the uh, recruitment activities and help for uh, Kofi and the talent acquisition team. And also, um, I'll actually go through a few examples with you all and we'll actually be, do some coding. So for all of you uh, that are actual coders or that want to test their knowledge, you know, feel free to get off of mute because this will be interactive. I'm going to ask questions and we'll, you know, get through one of these questions on the test uh, today. Uh, if there's not anything else, I'm going to go ahead and continue with the slides. And I ask that you guys let me just get through these quick slides. I won't take long because I don't like being a teacher. And then uh, once we once I open up the <laughs> once I open up the uh, actual coding session, uh, feel free to come off of mute uh, and ask questions uh, wherever you see or you may be confused. All right. So the technical assessment resources. Uh, if here in this first uh, bullet, I have listed a few resources that are online to help you prepare for these technical assessments. If you haven't heard of any of these three. I'm gonna be honest with you that, and say that you're a little bit behind the eight ball and you need to catch up. Um, Leak Code, CoderBite, and HackerRank, which is, uh, in my opinion, the best out there, HackerRank, are some resources and URLs that should be bookmarked on your browsers. Uh, for those looking to get into the software development field or in uh, uh, internship or full-time uh, position, 
these are your best friends. There's a, other, uh, a few more other resources out there. You know, it's the internet, it's, you know, it's your oyster. You go out there and you can find as many resources as you can. Geeks for Geeks, um, W3 Schools are a few of the ones that I've come across and I enjoy. Uh, so these are your resources out there. Uh, Coder Byte and Hacker Rank, I believe, are free. And then Leak Code, maybe uh, you have to pay for uh, pay a subscription and whatnot. But don't um, don't quote me on that. But feel free to go out there and check it yourself and sign up. Definitely sign up for Hacker Rank. Like I said, as they're in my opinion the best out there in the business. So these technical assessments is it's this is nothing that you actually wake up and you do it two or three times and you get right after that. You know there is a um, a resource out there that I forgot to mention, but uh, I don't know how many of you like to actually read books, but the Cracking the Coding Interview book is an amazing resource. It's a little bit outdated, uh, I would say about, you know, four years, but it's still a very good piece of material. I actually have it around here and I would show it to you all, but I don't, uh, I didn't have it next to me. But uh, Cracking the Coding Interview book, go out there, purchase it from Barnes and Nobles or uh, online. And that is a very good uh, tool to get you to understand, you know, if the fundamentals of coding, if you're not that at that point. Um, uh, but like I said, another great resource. And it, and in that book, so I, re, I mentioned that book to say that in the book itself, when you're reading the first chapter of it, it tells you to take this book and take all of the other, you know, resources and technical assessment practice that you're going to do to do this process two to three months before you even get to an interview. So that shows you that this stuff is nothing that you learn overnight. Um, school and the, the curriculum that you have done prepares you for it, but this is taking that, that theory that you learn in, in, in your curriculum and, and at the university and trying to apply it to real world issues or real world problems, or just, you know, um, just funky logic problems that they tend to come up with. And you'll see uh, in the example that I have. I, I mentioned this before, but understanding the fundamentals. So when I say the fundamentals, I, mention, I mean the actual libraries of your preferred language. So if your preferred language is Python, then you should be very familiar with the libraries associated with Python being able to uh, reverse uh, strings with the reverse function, all the different functions and uh, neat features built into Python, whatever you use in Python 2, Python 3. And the best way to do that is to read the source code. Uh, I give this hint to students because I think I tried to rush and do this when I was in your shoes, but trying to adapt to learn new languages or uh, be familiar with the latest and greatest language, please don't do that. Uh, there's a programming language that comes out like once uh, every two months. There's a new programming language out there. You know, I would say three years ago, you wouldn't hear any people talking about developing in Golang. And now there's Golang. You know, there's different libraries and updated libraries. Just find the one that you really like, that you felt that you had a connection with, and just stick to that one and know it in and out and apply your learning. So don't just, you know, do even the little technical assess. I think HackerRank is good to apply your learning uh, and, and some of the um, uh, really complex pr uh, problems that you come, uh, come across, but apply your learning so that it, it's heartfelt to yourself, right? So me, in my case, I'm very, uh, I'm passionate about basketball. So I play basketball, I coach basketball, I ref, Free basketball. I would love to eventually do sports science with basketball and taking stats, uh, you know, doing data analysis with, you know, with stats. So that's an outside project that I would create for myself with a preferred language that I tend to use. So that's what I mean, uh, apply your learning. Uh, take, taking something that you're passionate about and heartfelt about and combining it with uh, com computer science or uh, programming. And hackathons are really great, I would say, um, overnight kind of throw you to the wolves learning experience, right? So a hackathon, if you're not 
uh, if you're not familiar with it, is where you're given over 24 hours. Sometimes, you know, it's usually a weekend. They give you just straight coding, straight planning, business planning, integration planning, and actual development of uh, a, of a certain uh, problem criteria. So we've had hackathons where we, we propose to the candidates to build a chat bot that will, I don't know, improve um, the communication between the elderly or something like that, right? Or just building a chat bot to assist with, you know, the healthcare industry. Uh, and then you're given, you know, over 24 hours, sometimes, like I said, 72 hours to build from start to finish this chat bot. And it just kind of, you know, it, it's like I said, it's kind of the throw you to the wolves learning, uh, learning experience. And I tend to tell students that the best way to learn is, is learning through your failures. So, you know, that that's pretty much all you're doing in the hackathon is you're dishing out code, it fails, you, you're debugging and finding out what's the problem and fixing it. And it's a team effort, right? It's not just yourself. So it's usually a team of three to six people that are all doing this. And uh, it's a great learning experience. So definitely go and do it. They're all virtual now due to the COVID pandemic, but that makes it even better. So now you're uh, collaborating with people that are not just in your vicinity locally, but, you know, brains and and those diverse uh those with diverse mentalities all across the world. And you have, if you have friends across the, you know, the country, uh, I would, you know, challenge you all to join a hackathon. Go to meetups. Uh, so there's meetup.com pretty much everywhere in, in the United States. And you can, in, in pretty much in every major city, there's a meetup group that, you know, that used to have uh, events and meetings to talk about JavaScript. So uh, I'm here based out of Raleigh, North Carolina and Research Triangle Park. So there was the JavaScript meetup group that I would go to and they would just talk about nothing but JavaScript, um, learning React and new React libraries, uh, X, XYZ. Go to meetups, find out about meetups and network with people uh, within that um, meetup group or, or that interest group. Follow the market. Uh, so this means being able to understand what is happening in today's technology, being up to date with current events. Uh, a lot what you see today is uh, it's all behind, you know, data scientists, uh, data science and AI. So um, that's what I mean by follow the market, being able to understand current events, what's the trend in technology, where, where are we heading to? Uh, like I said, we're in a big data environment today. And um, data scientists, machine uh, machine learning, and AI are the big, um, I guess you could say, uh, buzzwords right now. So, just following the market, being able to make sure you're tailing your skills towards the trend that technology is going to, and read about tech. A lot of people don't read tech, and uh, or don't read in general. I've noticed that with some of my younger. <laughs> Uh, co-workers, right? So some of my uh, teammates that are, you know, I lead, I, you know, I ask them just, you know, here's a lot of documentation for you. And then they just get scared and come to ask me the question to get it the quick way. Them, You know, I, I call these kids the microwave era. Right? You want everything, you know, microwave and quick instead of actually putting it in on the stove and, you know, and cooking it through, right? So, you know, read through it, digest it. That's the best way to learn. If you're reading about tech and kind of, uh, uh, it's all surrounding, you know, surrounding yourself, surrounding yourself with tech. Deshaun, I don't know if you uh, saw something in the chat, but there was a, a question of, do you have any websites for keeping up with what's going on in tech? I feel like, you, you know, you could put into certain, certain hashtags into Twitter to do that. But if you had anything else along those lines. Oh, yeah. Um, there, uh, one I, I tend to follow is Engadget. That's E-N Gadget engadget.com uh, is one of the ones that I kind of click on and read about. Um, there, there's plenty out there, um, but I'll, um, I guess I'll throw some in the chat later too. Uh, but Engadget is a good way, a good one to start. And then they tend to um, link to other websites that write the articles if they haven't wrote the articles themselves. Okay. So as far as taking the actual assessment, 
Um, these are my tips to you uh, when you're taking a, any assessment is to make sure you attempt every question. Uh, there are, you know, sometimes you see how many questions you're going to take and the time limit that you have. So you should make a conscious effort to um, divvy up that time towards a specific question. I know with people, you know, like myself and the computer scientists in you is just eager to find and, and, you know, if you run into a problem, you're just so eager to find out, all right, what's my problem? I need to get it right. And I need to, you know, see that, you know, all the test case pass before I move on. And that can haunt you uh, when you're actually doing a technical assessment. So be aware of the time that you spend on, on the question. If you have two hours to take uh, the, the test and make sure you, and you have four questions, make sure you put your, you know, a 25 minute, uh, 25 minute time frame on yourself for each question and then leave yourself a little buffer at the end to go up and wrap up all, all of your questions. So I, I mentioned the buffer at the end so that you can leave comments uh, if you do run out of time. So I actually have seen some of these and, and grade some of these technical assessments and a lot of people that just leave them blank or just you just never got to it. If I see a person that actually left comments in the code and was like, well, I ran out of time. This is my pseudo code of the solution that I wanted to do. And this is where I was thinking I would give that person the bump versus the, you know, the person that didn't leave anything. So just leave comments if you uh, tend to run out of time with your thoughts and, and your solution. Uh, or if you don't have a solution, like I said, just your thought process of, of trying to solve that problem. This last one, and especially in hacker rank, is a very important one. And it's think of every edge case. And when I mean edge case, I mean all of the different perspectives of the problem, right? So if if you put your, put a, a address into Google Maps, right, they give you multiple routes to choose from. And those are the, the different cases, right? They don't always tell you to go this route. So in the same case where Google Maps provides you alternatives and alternative routes, you have to think about the problems that you solve as, you know, what is an alternative way or the edge case that I might be missing that I'm not providing a, uh, the actual solution for. And I'll show you one of those edge cases in, in the example today. Always run your test cases. So HackerRank um, allows you to run test cases in the um, tool and you can run them as many times as you want. In some of the test cases, you can actually see the input that's given to you, but I don't think that helps you. What's gonna help you is understanding the problem, understanding the constraints of the problem and et cetera. Uh, so being able to read the problem, take you know two to five minutes to read the problem over and over and understand what you're trying to solve. Uh, bring your knowledge. And I, you know, I say that just bring what you what you know and and i gave this hint and, and advice before in the previous slide don't try to learn something new the day before just come with what you know and know it in and out and the last one is don't cheat because we can actually see when you copy and paste code all right off awesome so this is one of the questions here that i'll be going over and um it's, it's called the maximum occurring character. Uh, and, and some of the other questions that you may see are, you know, are multiple choice. So I'll go through this one real quick, just to kind of, kind of show you guys, this is a, a fairly simple one, but um, uh, asking you what's the output of the program. So for the C++ folks in here, um, can anyone help me with trying to figure out the output here? And you can go off of mute and feel free to comment and, or ask questions about what you see here. Anybody? Does anyone have any challenges unmuting or you want to type your question inside the chat box? Otherwise, this will be a short session. It definitely will. Um, inside of main for base B, you create an object of um, you create an object of the base class and you pass in um, 10 and 20 for the parameters. So B that display data should print out um, the values of A and B, which would be 10 and 20. And the same things happen for derived um, the D object and the C object. 
Fair enough. In the C object, you're printing out um you're printing out the values of C and D again. Okay. So what are the, the values going to be uh, going to be printed out? So we say we say here that you said inside of main we're creating uh, um, an object of the object. base class. Mm -hmm. And you pass in for the parameters for um, A and B as the integers 10 and 20, and you call the method display data. And as a result, with the C out, you get um, A and B printed to the um, console. Then you got the same thing happening for the um, D object of the derived class. You pass in 30 and 40 as the integers. And then this um, D dot, then you call it the method display data from the, um, the D object, you get the same thing printed out, um, the values of 30 and 40. But when you create the, um, C object of the derived class and you call it display data is just reprinting out C and D because you haven't updated, you haven't passed any new values in the memory. Okay, so now we have 10, 20, 30, 40, and then the last, the last one is gonna display what? So you're saying the last one is C, this C dot display data is gonna return uh, 30, 40 again? Well, one second. Matter of fact, no, because when you call, you're, you're not you're create you're calling it from the um you're creating you're creating an object from the constructor, so the, the initialized values of C of C and D are going to be equal to zero. So you're going to be printing exactly. out zero to the screen. Exactly. So as you can see, the answer here is 10, 20, 30, 40, 0, 0. Um, my name is Jaden. I'm a computer engineering major at LSU, and I'm minoring in mathematics and computer science. I'm a junior, and I'm a third year student. All right. Awesome. All Thank right, you, Jaden. Good, good job, Jaden. Do that every single time. State your name, college, and major whenever you ask a question or whenever you answer a question. I also see a lot of people in the chat that are commenting, so I expect for you to, uh, to go off mute the next time uh, Deshaun throws out a question. Yep. So this, this is very good. He, he almost got a little stuck right here. That's why I asked you again. But when you create this class here, there was no information passed. So you're going to uh, you're using the default constructor, which actually initializes it to zero, zero. So the answer is 10, 20, 30, 40, and then zero, zero. So this is, you know, some of the multiple choice that you may see uh, in the test. And it'll be something like that, or to ask you about the theory uh, or what you learned in, in, um, in the curriculum. So, you know, tell me about, you know, the runtime or big old notation of, you know, this X, Y, Z, okay? So going back to the sample problem that I'm going to discuss with you all, I'm going to read the problem here. And I hope you guys can see this on my screen. I've blown it up. I can blow it up some more. Can you guys come on? Is that better? Can you guys see? Yes. Yeah. All right. Awesome. OK, so um, so here's the problem here. Uh, it's going to be returning the maximum occurring character. So essentially what we're going to be doing is reading a, a string of input and returning the character that occurs the most in that actual input. So for example, here's a sample case right here. You have hello world. So for every character, we're going to essentially find which one cre is created the uh, occurs the most. In this, in this case, it's going to be L. You see three uh, characters of L in this input. So your actual output would be just the letter L. Does anybody have an idea on how we would go about solving this problem? I have an idea. OK, can you state your name? Uh, in school? Name Joe Barr. I'm an electrical and computer engineering student at Rutgers, sophomore. Um, okay. My idea, wait, we have to solve it in like, you can solve it in any language, right? Uh, right now, we're just talking about, uh, you know, um, the okay. pseudocode, right? Okay. Just the logic behind it. All right. So, like, we know it's a string. And we know that a uh, string has, like, characters. Wait. Oh. I yeah, I'm sorry. I hit the button. Give me one second. Oh, so. yeah. And um, <laughs> we could just, like, index a string and then make, like, uh, I guess we can make variables or not variables, like dummy variables that count the uh, a certain character. I think we're doing letters A through Z. So you could do that. But that's going to take, like, a while, though. Or is it? I mean, I mean yeah. I mean, it's going to be, like, very, like, tiresome to, like, 
type W A through Z and like have a variable named after it, and then you just update those variables. Yeah, I mean. so that that you have a you're in the right direction, right? So in, on how to think about it, where you're saying uh, we have to keep account of the A through Z variables. I mean, A through Z uh, letters in alphabet. But essentially, this question didn't give you know it did say the constraints are A through Z lowercase a through z uppercase and zero through nine so this is one thing where I, t I mentioned earlier being able to understand the constraints and the edge cases so um what i like to do for this case is um actually use the ASCII values right so every character in um a through z uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with ASCII values, but from zero to 128 um, are the ASCII characters. And that, that includes some pronunciation signs that you see, uh, single quotes, slash, question marks, et cetera. There, uh, every character has an ASCII value in, in, in uh, computer science. So what I would essentially do is like how you're saying from A to Z, I would create uh, an array that will... Uh, account for all the first 128 ASCII character values. And if you guys don't know the ASCII character values, I suggest you look them up. ASCII like this. There we go, ASCII table. As you can see here, there's an extended version and then there's the actual um, 128 version, which will take care of all of the you see here, all of the keyboards, numbers, ABC, and lowercase and uppercase up to 128. And then there's an extended version that goes to 256. Yes, 255. So you guys shouldn't understand that every key on your keyboard has an ASCII value. And this is essentially the array that we're gonna have right here. So I can create an array of 128 that'll account for every single uh, character in, first, in the first 128 characters on the, out of the ASCII chart. Is anyone familiar with this? Okay, I accept. Yes. Yep, yep. You guys should yeah. get familiar with that. So. This is important. So in, in Joe, you're, in your case, you were only thinking of A to Z, just the lowercase. But we have to think, think about the numbers and et cetera. So it says maximum occurring character, not maximum occurring alphabet character. So small things like that will cause you to miss the actual test mm. cases. OK? And then, Deshaun, there were a couple of questions in the in the chat from Jonathan and Danielle, as well as and Taylor just asked another question. The first question was, could we use a hash map to store each character in the string and a count for each one? Okay. And then yes, yes, then, yes. So there's there's multiple ways of doing it. Uh, there's different uh, data structures, right? So I'm going to use an array. You can use a hash map, and then uh, account for every character that occurs on that hash map and just increase the count. That's a very possible way of doing it also. And then you just return the max, whatever uh, of that hash map. Okay. And, and then there was, uh, Danielle asked a follow-up to that question, wouldn't an array be better than a hash map instead of the linked list connected to the array since we could look at each number without being worried about the linked list? So um, from a space complexity perspective, yes, an array uh, is uh, better, the better choice to use instead of a hash map. So, you know, and it's, and, and then I think when you guys, uh, that's why I said bring your knowledge because some people are maybe used to creating hash maps or creating, um, you know, whatever uh, data structure that they're typically used to using and uh, going about the problem. So I, from a space complexity and time complexity perspective, you're not gonna run into that in hacker rank. So bring your knowledge. There's thousands of ways that you can answer this uh, question and I'm providing you one of the best solutions uh, that I've know, that I know ex uh, exactly. So 
Um, but that's not to say that your way is not right. That's why I mentioned to run the test cases uh, when you do this, okay? Um, any other questions, Kofi? And then couldn't, could you use an array list instead of an array? But I think you answered that. Yes, yep. Use whatever data structure that you're, that, uh, you're most familiar with. Okay, so how, how are we doing on time? So I can... I believe we have to top the hour, so four o'clock. Okay. So 23 more minutes. All right, let's, all right, so let's knock it out. So we're actually gonna do some coding. So we talked about the logic. We talked about the pseudocode and what we wanna try to do to solve this problem. Now we're gonna actually do some uh, coding. I do C++, you know, I'm a, I, that's just what I learned. That was my first programming language that I've been programming since like 10th grade in high school. So that just kind of stuck to my brain, but I I try to do Go every now and then, and I, I didn't want to bring Go since uh, there's not a lot, it's a very new programming language and uh, they probably might not be teaching you that in university. So I'll use C++, it should be a um, foundational language across the board, but you can apply this in any other language uh, when you go home tonight. So, the first thing that I will want to do is we, we all talked about, um, I showed you guys the ASCII chart, the ASCII table chart. So we're going to, we can create some global variable and say ASCII table um, equals, right? And that allows us to, uh, to use this function for both the 128 array and the, the 256 array. So then we essentially, we could just change the ASCII table constant formula at the top from 128 to 256. But for, for this sake, we'll just say 128. And then, like I said, I, I really uh, suggest you guys that don't know about it, you go and look into it and understand it. So we'll say 128. And this is just the uh, array that I'm going to use to keep the count of the uh, occurring characters in the string text that's given to me. All right, so what's the first thing we do, or I, I like to do, uh, what, what should be the first thing that we do when we're creating a function that is a character function? What are we doing here? Can someone help me out there? It's usually the first thing you do. Make a for loop to go through the string. Yes, so we're gonna iterate through the string uh, and can you say oh, your name? Oh, sorry. Dania Williams. I'm a third year at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. You got oh, the computer D out science. Here. Yeah. Okay. What up, though? Got the Detroit out here? It's good. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, we are going to uh, use a for loop to iterate through the um, string, but as a, a thing function. Is, you need to get the size of the string so you can know when to stop the for loop. Exactly. So we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll do all of that. So we'll put a, oh man, I keep, I don't know what's keep talking about taking off my screen. So we'll put the, the blank for loop here. So as we know, we have to do that. We need to keep track of um, the actual length of the string. So we don't jump out of the for loop or we get an out of bounds error. So let's say, let's grab that. So how do we grab the length of the string? Size of text. That, yep, that's one, and then it really depends. So you need to resize of, right? You need to understand the, the, the foundation of that, uh, of your, uh, of the language, because I believe size of is only for specific, I don't think you can use it with a string. You gotta double check me, but that's, you know, this is what I mean by understanding the source, source code. See, that's for an array. That's the length of array. We are, we don't have an array yet, right? So we have a string, uh, get out of the way. Sorry. We have a string here, so we can't use size of. So uh, if you have a string, you use this right here. It's called text.length, okay? So, so, the, so, so we've come across a few, um, a few of these nuances that you have to understand about programming and, and, and what they're actually giving you. So we have to know that the, the, the actual structure that they gave it to us was a string. So we need to use any function 
that can take in strings and not uh, an array. You follow me, Jaden? Yes, sir. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to use uh, the length, and we got the length. Now, back to what I was saying, because we have a function here, we need to return something. It's a character function, so we need to return a, a character uh, data type. So I'll create, oh crap, I'm saying character and write in. So I'll create this, right? Some result that we're gonna end, uh, end up returning. ID. Make sure the brackets line up. And we're gonna return it. That should, that should be your number one thing. So that way we can debug the function without any, you know, if we run into problems above uh, above this line right here, you know, this your last line is gonna return a result. So that's usually like the first thing I do when I create a function. I, I know that my function, if it's a void function, then I know I don't need to return anything. But if I'm, it's an actual character function, then I need to return this character and I'm gonna put that in there. So now we can run, we could run a compile and run this code and get our errors. Uh, well, and we know why it's failing, so. Excuse me. So, um, yeah, that was the first thing I would do. So let's go back to make sure that we have all of our uh, variables needed. So we have the array to keep track of how many uh, how many times the characters occur. We have uh, the length, and what else do we do we need here? We need to initialize the for loop to zero. Okay, and as far as variables, right? Um, we're returning the maximum, right? So we need some variable that's gonna say max that will keep track of the actual um, maximum times it occurs, okay? So am I losing anybody? Are we bouncing all over the place? Are we good? I got a thumbs up from Danielle, thank you. All right, so now we have the max, we have the results, we got the length. And Jaden talked about initializing the for loop to zero. So we'll say this is equal to zero. And we want to loop when I is less than the length, right? So we don't want to jump out because we set length to the actual length of the text. And we want to increment every time. Okay, this look good. All right, so let's do it. All right, so what's our first thing to do? We, we are we're at the first, let me give you guys a, let's do, all right. So this is the example one that we're gonna go through. We're not, we're at our first loop. Uh, we're at the first index of this array, right? But do we have an array? How do we get to this first character of the string in text? It's gonna be index zero. So text of I would be index zero. Is it? Go ahead, um, sorry about that. String can be considered an array of characters and we know that array start at index zero. So since the string is an array of characters, we know that the first index of the string is gonna be text of I and as initialized to zero. So text, text of zero is gonna be the first character of the string pretty much. Okay, so let's try that. So you're right. saying, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I had a question about that. Wouldn't we want to set the result equal to the first character and then change it as we go if necessary? So then we could have started it at one instead of zero for the for loop. All right, say that again. Like if I would have set the result to be the first character, say we set it equal to D. And then if I came around, once we get to the G, to re then set it to G, like to start it off as text of one or text of zero is equal to the result. So then I can start incrementing from one on. I get what you're saying, but essentially that's what happened in the for loop. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll get there. Mm -hmm. So you're right. So we'll, we'll start counting the first variable, the first character, and we'll set it to max because max is zero. And once, once you do the first character, D is going to be one. So it, you'll automatically set it. Yeah, so you got the right uh, picture. It just it's the way you said it. It didn't. It, I didn't hear it right. So, Jaden, we said text zero, right? Yes, sir. 
All right, so how do you want me to do this? Text zero like this? Yes, sir. That's, oh, that's actually, it'll be I. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's right. I. Okay, so let's try to let's try to print this out. Actually, I have a quick question. Yep. Sure. So, um, I don't know C plus plus because I was taught Java. So, do you have? I know that in Java we have to use like caret and stuff like that in order to to specifically compare one position of the text. Like for example, dogs that only have to do with D. Do you have to do any of that type of sort of thing with C plus plus? That is very correct. So I wanted to run this for Jaden so that, you know, I can show you all, you know, as you step through the program and you hit any errors, you'll be able to, you'll be able to see. So debug output, we, you know, we are able to do, oh wait, oh yeah, <laughs> let me put dogs right here so I can follow the actual sample I gave y'all. So yeah, you can do that also, or you can do it this way here and um, running, running, running. And you see as, as a text dot out, um, as text I. So you could do it either way. So let's let's talk about what, what Christian said. So um, if you have a string and you actually want to break it up. So there's a way, I, I think we run into an issue here, Jaden, down the line where you can't use it in a string because a string is multiple characters. But um, but there is a way to break it up in C where you just copy that string into um, an array of characters, right? So let's create some sample array. Let's say, let's call this text one, right? And um, we have to give it the length. I'm gonna go fast now so I can make sure I finish. You got to give it length plus one because in C++, you have the delimiter at the end. Um, if you guys don't know that, you should definitely look into that. And um, it's called string copy. Exactly. See? So this string copy function is you take the actual string, uh, the character of um, the array of characters, which is the destination, and this is the source. That's how you hear source. So you essentially just do text one, and then it'll be length is our, I'm sorry, text. And it's a C like that. So this is what uh, Christian was talking about, actually taking a string and actually separating it into specific characters in an array. So I'll do it like that. I, I got to come back to you, Jaden, on why this is not the right way. It fails somewhere, but I can't I can't remember why right now. But if you're actually comparing the characters, which is what we want, then you want to break it out of a, a, a string and separate it into an array like this. So it'll look like an array of characters. All right. So this is what I did with this string copy function. You can look this up. This is actually a C function. It's not, it's, it's a C, it's in the C library. So that's why you see here this C. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's move in this, in this for loop. I got nine minutes. And actually D, if you could, uh, if you could do it in a few minutes and then give a day in the life and then let, let me get like a couple minutes at the end to go over some IBM opportunities. That'd be great. Yep. So, so what I'm going to do now is we know that for every count, uh, every character in this um, array of characters that represents the ASCII table, we need to uh, add a plus when it occurs. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, so as you see here, come on. So as you see here, that's what I'm doing. So I'm gonna iterate the count of that uh, character that occurs and and then, uh, ah, here we go. So iterate that count when it occurs, text one I, and then compare it to max. 
and make sure that uh, max is uh, the new count is greater than max and then I'll set it to result like Danielle said. All right, and then that's pretty much it. So we'll go ahead and run this and we should get a return of G. Boom, and simple like that. So that's one of the easier pro uh, problems that we've run into of you know taking uh, a solution like this and returning the maximum number of characters. Now where you get into an issue is where it says in the case where the characters, there's two characters or X amount of characters that occur at the same maximum amount of times, always return the earlier one. So if I put the same amount of Ds in here, and run this code, it's actually gonna fail. Uh, well, I think I do it like this. Sorry. Gee. One, two, three, four. Oh, give me another G right here. So you'll see the, the funky uh, test cases that they'll give you just to test the edge cases. Uh, did I do that wrong? No, you did it right. You, you know. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it should have it should have returned D. But yeah, this, there's a funky case where it actually returns the wrong uh, variable. And you need to make sure that you test to make sure um, that you always return the first one that occurs in the string. Okay, uh, Kofi, that's it for me. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a quick uh, overview and so into Hacker Rank. This is what it looks like. This is what you'll be playing with. And um, feel free to go out there and, and practice. And then Deshaun, I know you're I know you're busy and we appreciate you taking your time. Could you give a day in the life of like one of your crazy days? Software <laughs> oh no, nah, this man I, I don't know. This is what I do is it's it's totally different from from some of the other you know guys that work at IBM. But essentially I own the cloud infrastructure for IBM uh hyperprotect uh services. So that's the mainframe on cloud. And um Crazy days for me are like pretty much, I work with a global team. So I'll get up at 6.30 in the morning to work with my Germany team. And then I won't be done till about 10 o'clock at night because my China team is coming online at 10 o'clock in the morning, their morning. So um, it, it's just unfair for me to scare you all with, with my uh, work schedule because I work with a global team and um, own a cloud infrastructure. So I have a really um, huge responsibility to maintain the cloud um, I've, I've, I've traveled all over the world. So even in Australia, when I was 11 hours ahead of time, I had to work pretty much like 15 hour days so that we can work with the, uh, you know, a Dallas based team to configure cloud direct links. So, uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to scare you all, but, um, but this is typically, I don't do this stuff. So a lot of stuff that I do it's more so networking and talking with cloud infrastructure. So as you can see here, I'm in London uh, configuring uh, storage area network switches uh, for our environment. So that's my typical work day, but you know, it, it's different. So um, it's not to scare you. Uh, it's just when you do have a lot of responsibility, you know, you have to put in that work to uh, make sure that you are um, handling in from a site re reliability perspective, you're, at a 99.999% uptime. So you guys will hear about that when you start uh, joining the industry. Thanks, Deshaun, I appreciate it. And yeah, I, I'm not a developer, I'm, I'm a recruiter, but I, <laughs> I speak a lot with developers and you know, a lot of times they're like, oh yeah, I work 40 hours a week. And then, you know, as you climb and grow your skills and if you wanna work globally, um, you might, and, and also be a manager, you might put in a little bit more time like Deshaun just explained. Oh, uh, so there was a question of uh, Deshaun, is there a language barrier? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So um, the, I'm, I'm actually in a, uh, deploying a cloud environment in Japan and we have to like provide all of the documentation, et cetera, days ahead of time so that their translator on their end can work with them to set up, you know, our environment. Um, typically if there wasn't a pandemic, I would actually be in Japan right now, uh, deploying our cloud environment. But um, due to the pandemic, I have to do everything remotely. So I tr train remotely people to stand up cloud environments. But there is a, a very bad language barrier. So um, we just have to get through it or I just have to learn German and, and, and Mandarin. <laughs> awesome. And then a couple more questions. Um, the first one, is MATLAB a valid language to keep as your one good programming language to know well? Say that again, MATLAB? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might be a, a computer engineer guy or electrical engineer guy. Um, so yeah. I don't work with MATLAB at all. Uh, that's more so for uh, those tools. Uh, you guys might be um, simulating something. You guys use MATLAB, but I don't use MATLAB at all. So I can't um, answer that question for you uh, properly. And I would just say to supplement Deshaun's answer, really you want to be looking at a, at a job description anyways and seeing what they're asking for from a program language perspective even if you're not ready to apply to that job just knowing what you should be learning is super helpful uh the next question for test assessments will we be allowed to use an ide or will it be in something like notepad um yeah so what i was just showing you all um that was an uh, integrated ide into am i still sharing my screen Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is an integrated IDE. So I can change this to Python, uh, Bash, which is a language I use a lot for shell scripting. Um, Go, I use GoLang, Java. You can change this and it'll, it'll re revise it for you and com compile and everything in that language. So Hacker, like I said, HackerRank is the number one tool out there. They have integrated IDEs for the technical assessment. Perfect. And Deshaun, I'm going to uh, start talking about the uh, landing page and some roles that I want them to apply to. But if you could answer those questions in the chat, I'd appreciate that. Will do. So as I shared with you earlier, everyone, I really want y'all to go to uh, the landing page that I linked earlier and I'll link it again to make sure Kevin gets it too, but let me share my screen. So we have a landing page for all of our uh, NACME candidates. Uh, and I want you to refer to the link that we sent you. Once you get here, you can see all the opportunities that we have posted. Um, right now, um, I would say we are looking for, you know, backend developers, uh, reliability and, and testing, um, our testing, automation and testing, as well as a reliability engineer. So I would, I'd be looking in here and seeing what job opportunities we do have available um, before applying um, as far as, as connecting with recruiters, because I know that was a question, how should you connect with them? A great way is to utilize sessions like this one that we have, that we have set up with, with the NACME org. Um, so I would be making sure to attend events like this to really get the best bang for your buck, um, attending diversity conferences and attending hackathons. Hackathons are a really great way to not only build your skill set but connect with other companies and, and recruiters at those, at those events. And IBM does hire interns with entry level skills in cloud computing, but we need you to be able to pass our coding assessment via hacker rank. Are there any other questions? We can have one more question. I know we're over time, but I wanna make sure to answer a, a really I important question. I have a question. Uh, so about hackathons, um, personally, I've attempted to look for hackathons in the past, but I think it's a little difficult. Uh, so I was wondering if you know any resources uh, to help us find hackathons available uh, of uh, sort of our skill set as well. And just, yeah, yeah that was my question. Yeah. So um, I know a lot of universities run hackathons. Um, I know uh, conferences also run in hackathons too. Um, I, I think I've been to one hackathon at, at National Society of Black Engineers. Um, I would be working 
if you if I, I I would actually throw that question back to Deshaun to know what other ways you can find hackathons, but I'd also be leveraging this org. So I'd be reaching out to like Kevin and the rest of the rest of the NACME staff to see, hey, can we have our own hackathon? Maybe we reach out to other companies and help them help us staff this event. Uh, but how how can we have a hackathon with just us? Or leveraging your university as well too. We should have a hackathon. That could be a great way for us to build our skills and also network with companies. I'm sure we would welcome that partnership. So just to be respectful of everyone's time, I'd like to, on behalf of NACME, I would like to thank Deshaun and Kofi from, and our sponsors at IBM for this wonderful, in-depth and engaging presentation. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, everyone else, thank you so much for participating. I know several of you have class or the homework studies. Please note that this has been recorded and um, our goal is to pull it up on NACME TV by December, by the beginning of December, but I may be able to provide a link to the recording once we do some minor editing. Also, you should be receiving a post survey within the next half an hour. I'll ask that you complete that so that we can provide that type of feedback to our partners here at IBM as well as to yourself so we can continue doing uh, more great presentations. And we do have a presentation next week. So be sure to pay attention to your email or check the uh, NACME website real soon. And on that note, I'm Kevin Smith, one of the program managers here at um, NACME. And you all have a fantastic evening. Again, Kofi and Deshaun, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks, guys. Later, guys.